right. I'd like to call to order the December 9, 2015 meeting of the South Borough School Committee. First order of business is audience sharing. We have some audience. Any sharing? Okay. We'll move on to new business. Uh, report from the South Borough Education Foundation. I believe uh, we have Kathy Cook here. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Excellent. And I think she's going to join us at the table. While she's approaching the bench, if you will, I'd just like to uh, share some good words about the work that the Southboro Education Foundation does throughout the year to support innovative practices and um, excellence in teaching and learning through their grant awards. One of the uh, most enjoyable um, activities to look forward to, at least I've found that to be the case in the last couple of years, is actually the awarding of the grants um, at the town common house each year and, uh, the ed foundation does an amazing job of celebrating all of the good work that's taking place and really supplementing um, our budget with uh, funding to support new programming so we're delighted that she's here of course christine particularly had a good year this last year her first year um, i don't know if the first spelling bee she came to I was particularly embarrassed when they yelled out, did you sign the ethics law before you did the violation law? As they yelled out from the back front of the stage. But it's, it was a wonderful event. So I think I've done enough. So I'm going to pass out a picture of the grant from this past year that I think was by far the more, most popular of um, all of them. It's one that was so popular, we actually tripled what was asked for because we liked it so much. And what we're hearing about this one is all good news. This, these are the stand-up desk that are kind of the rave now. People are using them in their offices. Um, and there's a lot of research saying that when kids, especially kids that are antsy and, and, and um, junky, stand up, they really can learn better because they've got a place to put the foot, there's a place they can kick, um, they, 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 you know, they barber and they kick and stuff. This is a picture of a um, child that is the son of a person on our board. And she says it's really, really helped him. So every class at Finn has one of these. When the grant was proposed, um, I think they asked for a four or five, so we decided we like this one, we got one for every single room. And I, I think you guys may have heard some things about it, but we're hoping that at the end of the year we're going to um, hear requests from all. So maybe from the Woodward, but there's just a lot of press about how um, yeah, good they can make desks are for not just kids, but for, for workers too, because people need to stand up. You know, mm -hmm. we're, 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 we're too sedentary. Um, so, anyway, so that's, that's the one that we like the best. We awarded fifty-one thousand dollars of grants this past year, which is one of the highest year. Just I've been on the board uh, nine years. I don't think we've ever turned down a grant that met our criteria in my nine years, and it definitely didn't last year. So we had a few that didn't meet the criteria, but the ones that did all got funded. Um, so we, we raised the money that we needed to. Didn't have to touch our endowment. That's still sitting there. Um, we raised the money with two main fundraisers: the spelling bee that is the main one, and then we do the red apple program. Christmas and, and the end of the year that allows parents to, because of the small limits on given to teachers, they can give to the SEF and we present a certificate to the teachers um, from the family which um, honors their teachers. So that's worked out pretty well. Spelling Bee continues to be pretty popular. Uh, we get a few complaints, but um, we, we revised it last year. We shortened it um, and I think that went up pretty well. So we're going to continue to do the Spelling Bee because we get you know new kids every year. It's, it's for the younger kids. We need to get the parents in. Uh, Trotty was great when they had spellers, but the parents drop them off, and so they don't come in. <laughs> so, they don't come in. <laughs> so we need to focus on the young kids because they have to have the parents with them. It's going to be a prerequisite this year. Yeah. yeah. So, and of course, the teachers um, <clears throat> come out on Friday night, dress up in the greatest costumes you've ever seen. The stuff they come up with is just crazy. The imagination that they use to 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 do it, they get up for the kids, and you know. It sounds like it's easy to spell, but it's not. Uh, you know, you get up there and no. you know, you've got 25 seconds to get out a word. You've got three people. You may disagree. you got your students down there looking at you, their parents looking at you. <laughs> and so um, it's not easy, but they do it. And so we continue to do that. So everything's going well. I've um, got a very, very active board this year. Got, it's full. Um, lots of good parents. We've got a good techie guy. We've got a good graphics person. So we've got a lot of variety on the board that really helps us do, do what we want to do. So, so far, so good. I don't think we've quite risen to, to Kathleen's um, experience in Marshfield, but we're trying to get there. So she's told us um, <laughs> how, how well they did and what all they did. But yep. we, so well, we think we can raise the money we need. Um, 
So we're still looking for you guys to, to push the teachers to come up with things that are innovative and cutting edge that will help improve the students learning experience. Very good. Any questions? Comments? Just comment. I mean, yeah. I was going to say, you know, Ed Foundation is something that I've known about and been involved in for, you know, our family for lots of years. It's just a, a, a great addition to the schools in the town. And there's so many things that I know when we come to budgeting, and Kathy, you know, with budgeting, that you sometimes have to just do the necessities in budgeting. And I, you know, we all look to the Ed Foundation to to spark ideas and stuff, and I think it's great. And, and it'll even come up in discussions we have, that might be something to go to the Ed Foundation for or something. So I, I just think it's such an integral and valuable part of the school. So thank you for continuing to work on it. And, uh, well, you know, we spent 50000 bucks, your budget is $17 million. Right. So it's a small piece, but we feel like it's such a um, you know, well-spent $50,000. You know, it's so targeted. And um, we're proud of the stuff we've done. The outdoor classroom, Ed, it will, we, we think it's great. Um, um, you know, the stuff we've done at FIT as far as, you know, the snowshoes, the, the climbing board, the resting program at Algonquin. So there's so many good things that we've done over the years. Art and math, Ed Trotter. Mm -hmm. So we just think that the money is so targeted well spent that $50,000 doesn't really um, tell you what we do. Um, it's, it, 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 it means so much. But, you know, so. Well, I, I agree with you on that. And I think that even though, you know, we, we you know, as a school system, school committee and administration, work hard to make sure that we think through where all the dollars are spent out of the school budget, um, a smaller group that sometimes can really put that extra thought, you know, even though it's not necessarily a lot of dollars percentage-wise, it's, you know, can put the extra thought into spending it well. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I go back to being on the joint committee back in the dark ages when there were two towns together. And I think you all really provide a um, important service and benefit to the schools. Now, can I get one of these for my office? <laughs> <laughs> well, I actually, I'm going to put one in my office. Um, I know, my husband has saying, one of those, so I really want to do it. And the research good. really says, kids do great, and then the minute they get to kindergarten, things change because you sit them down, right? Until they get there, they run around, they're active, which is what they're meant to do. So there's something about sitting them down that really is not necessarily good. So, so you know, can I buy this? So I was going to pass it out. This is the letter we just sent to South Florida, so we do every year to fundraise or such. I'd like to read that. And then here is a copy of the various grants. So you just read this whenever you have no choice to do. I have a question. Okay. So Kathy, in your nine years, what has been like your favorite, most popular, like the grant that you guys are most proud of? I mean, clearly you guys are very proud of these things. I mean, have there been others like this? The classroom, because Dr. Bobron was dedicated to him, and you know, that it just cool. seems like a grant that get the kids outdoors and yeah. look at all they can do, teach them outdoors, show them. So we like the classroom too, and yeah. for those two reasons. We really like the idea of having something dedicated to him after mm -hmm. the service he did. So that would probably be the favorite, but then um, the, I, we really like the standard desk. <laughs> I, I, just, I mean, to, to get a grant and say, well, we want to not only give you that, we want to triple what you have. We've never done that. Um, so no, that, one, that one truly was the best. So. <coughs> Thank you. I just have a question about it. So it's at Finn, the desk? Is there one in every classroom? Is that what it is? Yes, we have um, we have them spread out. Okay. We also have them at Woodward. Okay. We I had a surplus over at Finn, so we gave some to Woodward, and um, they they love them. So it's sort of a workstation we're using. It's, it a little uh, bit it more. is, yeah. And as Kathy pointed out, you know the kids from kindergarten to first grade, they are so used to center-based learning, right. and now it's more seated. And those kids that need movement breaks, right. it's the perfect solution mm -hmm. for them. Right. We've really utilized them uh, well. We bought some as well. Knowing how well they like there, so we purchased some for four of our classrooms. Did you really? We did. Yeah. Well, that's great. So good. Mm -hmm. It's a movement. It keeps on going. Keep it giving. Cool. Okay. Great. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> right. Brings us to the near school improvement plan. All right.
Principal Valenti is presenting her first in full improvement plan as principal of the Neary School this evening, and it seems like she has brought the audience with her <laughs> to the Neary School. I like to pack her in. Do you have copies? She's going to move it yep. here. Excited to be able to share this with you tonight. A little nervous, but very excited and very happy to have our school council in the audience as well. I want to begin by thanking our parents on our school council, Abe Hefiani, Elizabeth Masterson, Johanna O'Connor, and Christine Schifrin. Thank you for being here tonight. And our teachers, Dave Severed, head teacher beside me, Kim Collins, Sheila Finnegan, and Miriam Saldo. So I also want to give thanks to Amy Brewis, who without her hard work, I wouldn't have been able to put the video together that you're going to see. And you'll notice that both presentations for tonight are infused with technology. The first video was created with apps that students use on a daily basis. And being a digital native, my digital immigrant, it took um, a lot of learning to understand how to work to use each application and then smash them, smash them together. So uh, I was a learner throughout this process and as a result of it, we have a video to share with you. And the second presentation that you'll share, that I'll share is a Prezi. So I want you to sit back and enjoy our first video, which will look back over the first two years in connection to our 2014-2016 plan and it will showcase where we've come from and where we're headed to on our continued quest for success for all students. directly aligned to our district's Vision 2020 and technology plans. Our plan tells the story of Neary. Our journey begins with a look back over the past two years in connection to our 2014-2016 plan. So sit back and begin by imagining a learning environment that welcomes over 290 students, 30 teachers, 24 support staff, and many parent volunteers into its space every day. Each collectively works together with a shared commitment towards putting our best foot forward for our students, staff, community, and beyond. Let our story begin. 
strengthen our connections with parents and the community by utilizing social media sites such as Facebook and Twitter, as well as our NERI website to communicate all the wonderful things that are happening in our school. to integrate technology throughout the day in meaningful ways. It's used to assist in reaching curriculum goals and objectives for students. Teachers engage in ongoing embedded professional development by me, Amy Brewis, the NERI Technology Specialist, in order to facilitate and support the use of technology here at NERI School.
proving the importance of meeting each individual student's academic and social and emotional needs. Teachers and support staff work collaboratively to design instruction that is differentiated, comprehensive, and aligned to support our learners' various needs and abilities. We use an RTI approach and positive behavior interventions and systems. With a shared and sound education philosophy and approach, we help students to achieve their personal success each and every day. It was a group effort and it wasn't difficult to do because we are one school, one team, and everybody worked towards putting that together. So moving on to our new school improvement plan. So again, thank you to everyone for being here tonight. I'm going to start by reviewing our goals. And our goals for our new school improvement plan are directly aligned to our district's Vision 2020 and technology plan. And they tell, they tell the story of Mary. Goal one is our school climate and culture to foster a positive climate and culture that encourages innovation, risk-taking, excitement for learning and personal growth in a trusting partnership with Mary families in the South Borough community. Goal two, Curriculum instruction and assessment to promote academic excellence across all content areas by providing a comprehensive curriculum which meets the needs of all learners and includes a continued focus on analysis of curriculum assessment and data, instructional practices, and intervention systems. Goal three, student support to continue to build and support a robust learning environment in which all learners' needs are identified and met and all school staff are utilized effectively. And goal four, comprehensive learning environments for 21st century learners to continue to construct technology-rich digital classrooms where students and staff use appropriate and safe technology tool and tools and resources to support the learning and the teaching process. As we move through this process and as we do our important work each day, we, we keep in mind four guiding questions that are ubiquitous across all areas and help us to stay focused on, on outcomes for student learning and drives what we do each day. They are what do we want students to know and be able to do? How are we going to get students there? How are we going to know our students are there? And what do we do for those who are not there yet or who have gone beyond? So what do we want students to know and be able to do? This question is direct, directly aligns with our school one, two, and goal three. And how do we know this? We know because we are aligned with the mass curriculum frameworks, our grade level programs and initiatives, our atlas maps. We have our care themes. We have two word, 10 new words this year. Do you wanna jump in? Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah, Open circle and responsive classroom. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of pieces that really kind of create a, you know, culture is not just defined by one or two elements, it's, you know, really dozens, but we think highlight these as our primary ones that we've found that are effective, are helping to raise the comfort level of all the students and staff, uh, you know, and the last one, student leadership, you know, that's one where as they are knocking on the door of middle school, <laughs> You know, one of those opportunities where they can kind of get their toes wet before they actually are in middle school. And this year, um, starting in the winter, we're rolling out, kind of reviving the school 
student council, and uh, that was it was a, it's been a while since that uh, was was running, and so you know it's going to be in a different form I think than it was about ten years ago when mm -hmm. it was when it was functioning. So that's another thing to look forward to. But you know the students you know really starts at Finn, continues through Woodward, and then we're kind of just really building upon that foundation that they've started, and. That the students are just running with it, which is great. Mm -hmm. And the, the nice thing is that at the fourth and fifth grade age levels, they, you know, they take a lot more ownership, and they are just, you know, the independence level is a lot higher, so they can, they're approaching you with ideas a lot more than, mm -hmm. you know, uh, you know less, less guidance and more, you know, more coaching. <laughs> so, um, but you know, all those pieces really are part of what makes an area, you know, a great place to work and mm -hmm. to learn. So. Mm -hmm. So how are we going to how are we going to get our students there? Well, again, directly aligned to our goals one, two, three, and four, we do this by ongoing and purposeful professional development, which includes working with Dr. Il Dr. Ilda King, TLA. We've embraced the SRSD and Lucy Calkins writing, cafe model, social studies, our new and next generation standards. Uh, will be coming soon. Uh, our professional learning communities, we meet on a weekly basis uh, as grade level teams. Embedded within that, we're taught where we provide professional development in the areas, in all content areas, and we also work together as a data team looking at data across the grade levels and for each individual student. We provide project based learning opportunities, differentiation of instruction. Our building based sport teams meet on a weekly basis. And again, we utilize Open Circle, Responsive Classroom, and PBIS. So, in terms of pulling together the you know, data teams, which are you know, the fourth grade team or the fifth grade team, or whichever teachers are meeting that week, you know, there's always a large you know, or small amount of subjectivity when looking at rubrics and scoring. And you know, the nice thing is that we have common district-wide scoring rubrics now for you know, informative writing, opinion writing, and narrative writing. So now the next challenge is to have discussions and score like sample pieces you know, on a regular basis to make sure that we're kind of calibrating ourselves. Of like, oh, what do you think earns a two? What do you think earns a, a four? And you know, having those discussions you know, a few times before that unit might begin or before we go through and score you know, 20, 25 essays because in terms of looking at that data and pulling it together, you know, from the admin level or team level or you know, just the teachers talking amongst themselves, it's important to really make sure that you can be take some of the subjectivity out, keep it as objective <coughs> as possible. And you know, there's always going to be some piece of subjectivity because you know, you're, you're the one scoring the, the essays. Uh, but I think that the, those meetings and those teams this year have really helped us to get even more on the same page and kind of realize, oh, maybe this should be a focus. Um, so I think that's that's been helpful with our you know, weekly meetings that are not, you know, in addition to the staff meeting, it's mm -hmm. you know, built into the schedule this year. So that's, that does create a lot of more, create a lot of opportunities, so. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. And how are we going to know our students are there? connected to goal two and goal three. Well, we'll do this by looking at our, we have our diagnostic assessments, so those are the assessments prior to learning, our formative assessments during lo the learning, during daily instruction, observation, observations um, that teachers are making, sharing these rubrics with, with students so they understand what they're accountable for, our summative assessments, so those are the assessments that happen after the learning, and again, as Dave just spoke to, the common rubrics and assessments, we look at our MCAS, really break that down and, and dive deeper into what that, da what that data is showing us. Again, doing that, doing that, participating in that during our PLCs, as well as our staff meetings and our grade level team meetings, all on a weekly basis, building based support team and our data team meetings. And what are we going to do for those friends who are not there yet or who have gone beyond, connected to goals one, two, and three? We bring students uh, who are struggling learners into our building-based support teams, 
set goals for those students, track those goals, gather data in order to meet those the, each individual's needs. We have our tiered delivery of instruction. That's the art response to intervention, differentiation, explicit focused instruction, ongoing analysis of each student's present level of performance, and we set goals as teams and with individual students. And new this year, we just started our TAPS program, so that's teachers as pals, so students who are having some difficulty socially and emotionally, we're pairing them up with a teacher to provide that extra layer of support, that extra connection that, um, that we feel that they need. And as a team, one school, one team, we understand that the learning happens when students understand three things, where they are, where they want to be, and where they, what they need to do to get there. So being transparent with students, especially at our grade level, yeah. grades four and five, sharing that information, getting, helping them to understand what they're learning and why they're learning it, what is the purpose of their learning. You know, I think that as I piggyback on that idea, as, as I said before, this is the age where, you know, they are, they're just more, way more <coughs> aware of, oh, this is, this is getting real. <laughs> and they are, you know, knocking on the door of middle school, and I think a lot of them are, <coughs> excuse me, they want that. They want that, they want to rise want that challenge they want to push themselves a little you know even more and you mm -hmm. know that if they are you know if we're open and honest with them in terms of okay this is you know this is, this is what the expectation is and this is where we're aiming and this is what it would look like if we went beyond then they'll just go for it so mm -hmm. so at Mary we're one school one team with a collective ownership for all students each and every day and I just want to thank everyone for listening, <coughs> watching, and great things are to come in 1618 with our new school improvement plan. Any questions? Oh, I, it's on our near YouTube site. Mm -hmm. And I can share that out. It's called near YouTube. Not YouTube, but near YouTube. I can put a link to it on our Facebook and our Twitter. I can. Um, yeah. Any questions, comments? Well, I'd just like to say that was a wonderful job you did on the movie. Um, that was, you know, pitches. You know, pitches says a thousand words, mm -hmm. and you, know, you saw all those engaged, you know, students and teachers, and uh, I thought you did a great job. Thank you. So thank you. You're welcome. Great. I am way different than those in fourth and fifth grade. It's way more fun. I find the, I'm not sure what it was, the goals, but the, you know, the the points of, you know, what are we doing? We're determining where we want students to go. We're trying to make sure that we know how to get them there. We're trying to make sure we know when they are there, we know what to do with those people that either didn't make it or went mm -hmm. beyond. I mean, you know, those are very mature. I mean, it was, it wasn't our business, you know. I mean, you've got a goal, how we get there, you know, mm -hmm. when do we get there? And they're right. very mature um, um, points, which is impressive. Thank you. Thank you. Well, they always they rise to the challenge, and, and we're very transparent with them, with our students. Teachers share why they're learning it, and what's, what's their purpose each day, and how we're going to get them there, and we're going to work together as a team. I had the same thought. I was, I was impressed by that approach, and uh, seemed, seemed to be implementing it well. So, I had uh, a few questions. One sure. is, you said uh, you're going to be reviving the student council. Student called? leadership. Student we're, leadership. we're starting a le student leadership council. Yeah. It's beginning with our fifth grade students. A letter will be going home on the 18th, and so we will have two. We'll select two students from each classroom to begin with. Students will be able to write an essay, 
expressing their interest and why they feel they should be a part of the team and they will be responsible for helping to lead some of our community out outreach programs setting up some events that we have coming in the spring and also um, just demonstrating their leadership in and amongst the school and then we'll we'll move more towards the spring to bring on a second grade five leadership opportunity so so a second session and fourth graders so we'll start to groom our fourth graders for next year so when the fourth graders come back as fifth graders we'll have a team already established sounds good okay. uh, another question on the packet that you handed out ahead of time we had uh, under goal three student support you mentioned school partnerships school our net program our, our net program we have a um, New England oh. Center for Children. All right. that, that's our partnership. And then you mentioned you're using Facebook and Twitter to communicate with parents. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about how that's been going and any feedback you've gotten, any interactions? Yep, it's, been, it's going really well. We have a lot more parents on Facebook and we have a lot of hits, so I know that people are looking at it and we also share it on Twitter. I try to hit Twitter, Facebook, our Neary website with all of the same information. So parents have multiple way, multiple different opportunities, whether they're on Facebook or Twitter. Our Twitter um, numbers are rising, so that's exciting. Just, just offering different places for parents to gain the same information. It's got a lot. Yeah, our, Amy Brewis, our technology specialist, is quite the tweeter. <laughs> and she, and she uh, sorry. Amy. She does. She tweets a lot. She, uh, you know, any, she, she's, she's kind of the, you know, the, the person who's in all of the classrooms, obviously. And it's not, you know, she, everyone's just coming to the computer lab. There, she's going to the classroom, the iPads. You know, they're, she's mobile, a lot more mobile position than it was. And so, you know, projects that she sees, or you know, she'll take us to Mapshot, you know facts of the kids heads anyway and doing a project and she'll tweet that out and tag people and then we're working on uh, using a new version of brain pop and we're doing a project and then she tweeted that out and it was like at brain pop which was in headquarters in new york and then one of the executives there was like oh mm -hmm. this is, and this was great so you know um, everything so everything starts with the right. you know you turn the faucet on a little bit and right so brain know. pop <laughs> reached out to us reached out to amy and we've partnered with them to offer actually Dave's classroom an opportunity to use some of the kind of be test subjects test for subjects some for beta some testing, tests. beta you know, okay. fifth grade beta testers for yeah. some of the new features are trying to roll out that are a little more interactive and iPad based or tablet based, right. I should say. And so that's exciting. That's be probably in January yeah. we're rolling that. There were, you know, parents had to sign off. There was a, you know, so not only are we tweeting what's happening in the school, it's also giving me an opportunity and, and Amy especially to connect with other principals, other administration, other teachers to see what they're doing and we've brought a lot of it back into Neary. So it's a nice ex a professional exchange. Yeah, and that, didn't ha that wouldn't have happened if we weren't tweeting yeah, at Brain Pop or this right. project or, you know. Yeah. And we have a hashtag. It's hashtag Team Neary. So if parents aren't on Twitter, they can go onto our Neary website, click on the hashtag link, and it will give all of our tweets. And what we did last year, and we'll do it again this year, is have a parent coffee, bring parents in, teach the. We went through our whole Neary website, so parents knew where to find certain things they're looking for. The calendar, or my school box is new for us this year, so we brought them in to review that, and we taught them how to log on to Facebook, how to create a Twitter account. So providing that um, information to parents has helped to build our, our followers. That's great. Okay. Thank you. I yes. have one question. Uh, um, um, I was just going to ask because uh, most of us uh, at this table <laughs> um, lived through the whole one-to-one -one, mm -hmm. uh, project at Neary. And so eventually we never got there, but we got two to one, and then there was a lot of discussion about you know sharing with sharing the iPads with you know teachers and classrooms and stuff like that. How has that kind of ended up rolling out? I mean, is it now just business as usual, or are you still are teachers still kind of structuring their you know their 
curriculum around when they have the iPads? I mean, how is that kind of? Well, we last year it was 120 in grade four. Okay. And we got together as as team leaders at the end of last year along with Amy to try and make it more equitable across the two grades mm -hmm. so that students because our students moving from fourth to fifth we didn't want that accessibility to decrease <coughs> so we were able to structure it so that some classrooms every classroom has some type of device whether it be iPad laptop or desktop okay. and there's a there's availability and equity across both grade levels Okay. So, with a little bit of creativity, and our and our teachers are amazing sharers, and and they're very planful. So we've able we're able to continue what our fourth graders were getting mm -hmm. last year, and mm, spread it across the two grade levels. Yeah, and it's the, the week, with the weekly PLC meetings, the teacher meetings, you know, Amy Brewis might bring up a new app that she would like us to try, or we'll mm -hmm. be like, oh, this is a new one, or maybe we had that one before we did try it a different way so it's really kind of ongoing Kathleen and you know last year my I've worked on a you know teaching fifth grade last year as well and we shared an iPad cart with another classroom so it's kind of back and forth and you know we had to figure out okay you're using your number one on it you know it, it was mm -hmm. logistically tricky but we figured it out mm -hmm. um, and then this year we were the same pair of fifth grade classrooms where it's lucky to, to get an additional cart so we're really one to one, and that does really change the experience. And mm. you know, we're really lucky here in Southboro, the, the amount of hardware and the technology focus, and you know, it's you know, it really their brain, their brains are wired differently than ours. You know, you know, it's <laughs> it's it's true. It's, true. It's, it's a fact. You know, the, they're digital natives. <laughs> we're immigrants, yeah, or some of us are hybrids, and you know, but the, 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 yeah, they are learning differently. And I think that you know, to be remain a competitive district, remain of, on the, you know, cutting edge, we need to make sure that they're using, you know, what's the best tool, and I think a lot of them really are seeing the devices as tools now before, you know, I was on that committee, that one-to-one -one committee too, and, uh, you know, there was a lot of resistance sometimes, you know, there was a fair number of resistance, and, you know, in politics, you know, 30% of the people may, you know, might not like your message, it's not a big deal, like, oh, you know, but in education, 30% is way too high. And so then we kind of hit the brakes a little bit, slowed things down, kind of percolated a little more, did some more research, did some more future professional development. And, you know, I think we're in a great spot this year where the students are just blowing us away. We're learning new things, they're learning new things, we're pushing it out. And the tricky thing about being a teacher in 2015 is you really want to be at least one step ahead of them in technology. <laughs> Show them that you know one more thing at least, because the Come second on. that they see, oh, you know, I think I know more than Mr. LeBoy, <laughs> then they kind of start tuning you out. So that's the challenge that I think our NERI staff has stepped up, the administration has supported that, gives mm -hmm. them the time, and Amy mm -hmm. Brewis is an awesome right. tech specialist to, you know, teach us get these students too which is we what do. we love so that's part of our PLC on a monthly basis Amy will meet with each grade level PLC and then there will be a carryover two weeks later at a staff meeting a tech Monday and we've been able to provide lots of professional development this year around technology that again helps us to stay on pace with our students if not a little bit ahead sometimes a couple one step two step that, you know, I was going to say, you know, just because over the budget, talking about technology, et cetera, but just watching your movies um, shows that, uh, you know, we've always said there, you know, buying the equipment is just one step, mm -hmm. and then you mm -hmm. have to get the technology to use on the equipment, but then I just feel like you guys are doing, you know, it's, it just shows that those pieces are coming together. You have to have the professional development, but you also have to have the curriculum and the curriculum. So it, it was just a great example of how sort of those steps um, to where we need yeah. to be, because the kid, that's the way the kids are learning these days. Like I said, it looks more fun than when I was born. <laughs> but, um, Come on in, our doors are open. <laughs> <laughs> definitely join in. Um, but anyway, so I do have one question. What are the little robots? Oh, those, those are Dash and Dot. So that was from one of our grants that Amy Burles and Karen Fisher wrote last year. So it's it's really neat. During our PLCs, the students have enrichment, and one session of enrichment is coding. 
with the dash and dot. So those students, you saw the students with the iPads, they were actually coding um, the robot, either dash or dot, to move through the, um, the obstacle maze course or obstacle is. course. Or one day Amy put all, <coughs> all these cotton balls out and they had to gather the cotton balls, but the students actually had to um, code this the robots to be able to move and scoop up the cotton balls or snowballs. It's really neat. If, we, if they were larger, we could probably send, save the DPW some money <laughs> this winter, but they're pretty good. They are, you know, cotton balls for the cotton balls. Yeah. <laughs> The sidebars. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else? All right. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That brings us to a uh, presentation from the English <laughs> language learner assessment. Yeah. What's the name of this video? Rhoda. Come on up. the evening for exciting presentation. Yes. I think it's the month to celebrate. Good work in the district for sure. Rhoda is here to share with us her annual uh, update on the um, status of English language learners in our district, but also to share with us any changes in the state regulations and state mandates, and I'm sure there are a few uh, that she will be providing an update for us on this evening. So at this point, there are 94 English language learners in Southboro. Um, at the beginning, well, up to, up to today, we have uh, tested 56 students who came to our district with a language other than English. And the reason I mention this is because it takes over an hour to work with these students to be able to decide uh, through the assessment, the language proficiency level of the child and therefore whether that child qualifies for the English Language Development Program or not. So that's over 56 uh, hours of assessment by our uh, English Language Development teachers. Uh, worthy of mentioning is that 43 of those students were new students to the Finn School. So the trend in Southboro continues to be that we're growing from the preschool and kindergarten uh, up through the rest of the grades. Um, Another thing to mention this year is that um, the Department of Education is uh, uh, requesting that districts identify English language learners at the preschool level. So the next time I report to you, I'll be able to give you those uh, numbers. Uh, they're called um, at the preschool level, early childhood, uh, dual language learners. And a child at that point, of course, all children are learning language uh, when they're three, two, and four year olds, right? A dual language learner would be a child that is learning two languages at the same time, so learning them consecutively or learning them sequentially, so they've been exposed to one language first, and then another language is introduced. So we're working very closely uh, with our preschool coordinator, Yasuo Ki, and with all our preschool uh, team. Um, with children that come with another language, we get a lot of referrals for early intervention and to determine if a child who is a dual language learner, what level of language proficiency uh, the child is at in both languages, and in some of the cases needing to determine if that dual language learner has a disability or not. <coughs> so um, that is also something that takes um, expertise and time to be able to, um, to work on. Um, 
what this bar, the first page, does not show is that we always reclassify or exit children from the English Language Development Program. That is the goal, once they have reached language proficiency level. And we do exit students every year, and the regulations state that we need to monitor the students for two years to make sure that they're making effective progress. And our English Language Development team does that in conjunction with uh, cl classroom and subject teachers. The second page in your packet shows the languages spoken by our English language learners and their families. And this year, um, Portuguese is a prevalent language in South Peru, uh, closely, well, followed by Chinese, Russian, Vietnamese, and Spanish. And the third page in your packet is showing a comparison of the languages spoken by English language learners uh, this year compared to last year. So we do have a, more, a few more Portuguese speakers. Um, so that is a comparison by the two years. The regulations also state that if a family cannot speak, uh, read or write English, that the district is required to translate and, or provide interpreters so that the family can understand the child's education and also have access to be able to participate in the child's education. Um, so that um, the requirements say school documents and um, the children's progress reports and report cards. The next page in your document is showing um, the language proficiencies um, in Massachusetts. Massachusetts belongs to the Reader Consortium, um, and there are six levels of English language proficiency naming them from one to level six. Number one is entering, and it would be the first uh, bar graph that you see um, along the horizontal axis. The second level is entering, then it's, um, uh, sorry, entering, emerging, developing. The fourth level is expanding, the fifth level is bridging, and the sixth level is reaching. When the child reaches a level six, we're looking at multiple data with classroom and, and uh, subject teachers to um, be able to reclassify the child, meaning that the child no longer needs to be in the language language development program. That's why that uh, level is at zero, because we have reclassified children who reach the level six. If we go back to level one, at this point, there's 3.19% of our population at the entering level. Uh, below that are the amount of hours that we're required to provide of direct English language development instruction. New this year is that um, the department is looking at the third level developing as really two levels as regards providing instruction. So a, le a low developing or low level three and a high developing. Um, the reason for that is that it's quite um, I would not say easy, but a child can quickly go from a level one to level two and even a level three. What takes longer is to reach the higher levels. So a high level three and the four and the five, those are longer stages. Research uh, tells us that, of course it depends on each child, but it'll take five to seven years for a child to reach um, grade level language proficiency. And it depends on a lot of uh, multi individual factors as well. Um, the reason for this split in the developing level are the hours and instruction. So the bar below, which is new this year, is what the department's calling a foundational level. And the children are required a minimum of uh, 90 minutes a day of English language development. It is um, quite easy to identify children who are learning the language and therefore say, yes, they do need uh, English language development instruction. When because they can't access a curriculum, and they learn, they're needing to learn everything in the school environment. At the higher levels, it's not as easy to identify that, because that's when you have to go deeper into the nuances of the English language, uh, our English language. Um, but also the academic demands are greater on those students. They're closer to grade level. There's a vast amount of um, curriculum that they need to learn across all settings at school and now with a, a much more complexity of the language. Those students still need to receive instruction, 
Um, and if a child at that level three and four do not make that progress and keep growing, that's what they can plateau and become long-term English language learners. Of course, this is something that we look at every year to make sure that every child is making the progress that he or she needs to make uh, along the continuum. Our English language learners every year um, need to take um, two summative tests. Um, the state um, requires NPAS of all students, and um, also if they're English language learners, it's the ACCESS test. ACCESS stands for Assessing Comprehension and Communication in English, state to state. This will also give us the levels and also in decimal points uh, where the children are at. Uh, January and February is the testing window to be able to administer access. This year, it is a new test, and it's also a new format in that it is offered computer-based and paper-based. Uh, given that it's the first year, our English language learners at Trot here are going to do the computer-based test. Our students, grades one through five, will do the paper-based test. And our kindergarten students, it's a developmentally appropriate individual assessment centered around activities and games, and that has not changed. That remains the same. And when we receive those uh, reports, we're analyzing and sharing that um, also with classroom and subject teachers. But we continue to have a very strong home school connection. We get to know our families very well. Um, it's a whole, our school communities are the ones that really, every single person in the school is important in uh, embracing our English language learners um, across every minute of the day. Uh, we're learning language and they're learning our, the culture and how to perform in our schools. Uh, for our parents who want to learn English or want to improve on their English, we make sure that we're also uh, connecting them with organizations who provide adult ESL. So I thank you for the opportunity for sharing tonight. Um, and I'm open to any questions you might have. Okay, thank you. Yeah, well, I have a question. Um, yes. 43 students are new to Finn. Is that correct? It, it, now, how does yes. that compare to other years? Uh, more. Okay. Many more. Okay, because it, so if we have 43 that are new to Finn, they're really in that, that, that beginning range of English language learners, which would take more time and more right. effort. Am I, am I right on that? Or? So there were 43 students who registered with another language. With another one, okay. So that meant that they were, um, those were children that are uh, English language development teacher who we were very grateful became full time at Finn this year, uh, just at the right time. Mm -hmm. um, spent working with those children. And we also were talking to parents because it's not, it's something that you have to look very carefully at the use of language. So only about, um, um, not 43 students came into the program. There were many less that qualified into the program. Okay. Yes. Those are hours that we need to spend making sure that we understand the child and the, the English that each child has. But you're right, there are many more than we had last year. Just wondering, this, this is just for my own knowledge, yes. like the um, nine minutes a day that they're required, um, how do, you know, are you, is someone going in with them in the classroom or are they being pulled out? You know, right. that's just right. a lot of time, especially if they're a little older, just sort of. Right. Yeah. Just so, wondering how the logistics right. of how that works. So we, we instruct the children in small group. And of course, scheduling is always a challenge. And, um, at the lower levels, the children um, need that time because they're learning everything in school. You know, how to um, uh, say that they're not feeling well. Um, that's what kind of food they want off the menu. Uh, there's everything in day, every life, so every day that they need to be able to function in our school setting, which our school setting has a lot of academic language, just the social language is, is has specific terms. So in that case, it is both in the classroom and out of the classroom. And it depends, we look very carefully and work with the teachers of um, how to piece that schedule together. Yes. Anything else? Yeah, I think it's amazing that you have all the
those different languages and all those different <laughs> kids and, true. and pull it off and actually teach them English. So kudos. It's, uh, I just always look at it and I'm amazed. Thank you, Rhoda. Thank you, Rhoda. Thank you. Uh, next item is legislative update. I guess there's stuff going on. There, there's always stuff going on. Um, I think you know sometimes the challenge is to identify what part of that information that we receive on a daily basis has the potential to um, make significant changes moving forward. And just today, I received an email from. Um, the um, Superintendents Association, the director, Tom, Executive Director Tom Scott, sharing with all the superintendents that the Elementary and Secondary Education Act, which was the transition from No Child Left Behind um, under the Obama administration, has um, moved through the House and was passed by the Senate. And it will now no longer be ESEA, it will be ESSA, which um, is now Every Student Succeeds Act. And I think if there's anything that's um, come forward at, from the federal level, they've renamed NCLB and Elementary and Secondary Act, and we were just learning what that acronym meant, and now um, it's, it's going to change. But um, in all indications um, are that the new act really will provide greater flexibility at both the state and local level. Um, there's a lot of language that has come out summarizing this new um, federal law. Um, and I think we're very anxious to see um, what this really means to, um, to those of us at the local level in terms of um, not only state accountability but funding. There have been provisions that um, indicate that we might have some uh, more opportunities to use the funding that was otherwise very specifically earmarked uh, for certain <coughs> programs and, and certain um, identified needs in the districts in a far more comprehensive way. So um, I do have a summary which um, just came through today, and um, it really does identify uh, potentially re repealing some of the language that came about under no, uh, no Child Left Behind, like the adequate yearly progress, and replacing it with yet another statewide accountability system, hopefully an improvement, but that will, will remain to be seen. Um, Again, it will be sort of a warehouse uh, legislation around maintaining information about student performance, grades 3 through 12, but allowing states greater flexibility in terms of how that data is to be um, assessed and monitored. Um, again, gives greater affirmation to the states uh, around controls of standards like including Common Core, funds for improving low-performing schools, accountability um, changes for all students, targeting funds for at-risk children, helping, helping states again to um, increase teacher quality. We just went through a very extensive change in our ed educator evaluation system, which really was to focus on improving teacher quality. Um, supporting at-risk populations. Uh, Rhoda just did an amazing presentation, as always, on um, the composition of our English language learners in the district. and. That is definitely a focus of this new um, act. Um, greater flexibility, again, we keep hearing greater flexibility for schools and states to, um, you know, sort of manage their own um, accountability standards, and we have no specifics related to that. Um, high quality choices for parents, which translates to increased charter school and um, other options yet to be defined uh, with no identified um, language around equity of funding um, but providing incentives for these schools to to continue to develop and um, those are some of the identified uh, areas that um, this act embraces but one of the things that's very exciting, and we've talked about this a lot um, through Keith's presentation last year all the way through to um, those programmable robots that our students are coding at an early age, that uh, they do want to provide some additional funding to earmark programs like uh, science, technology, engineering, and math education, and to offer some preschool development grants, which, again, we heard about this evening and the changes at the preschool level, which you know really does impact our, our kindergarten, first grade, and, and on. Um, in the district so hopefully there'll be uh, much more detail and um, 
we'll just keep watch. Okay. It would have been more exciting had I put some bitmojis <laughs> attached to this, but perhaps the next revision. Is this the appropriate time to talk about the uh, MCAS decision? Um, it's actually on the combined agenda oh, that's right. uh, for okay. next week. Uh, we will be asking all three school committees to, as we did um, in June of 2014, take a vote to <clears throat> either adopt um, PARC or MCAS. Um, interestingly enough, if you administered the PARC test, you have no choice. Um, you will be required to once again administer PARC. Um, but the interesting um, dynamic that's taking place with the vote this year is um, last year it was pretty clear it was PARC, it was, uh, or two years ago when we piloted the program and then last year when we took the vote. But this year it's really a compilation of three different things. Um, even those districts that um, administered PARC last year and will be required to do so again this year will be administering PARC from the, at the three to eight levels. Uh, the science and engineering test will remain at all levels, MCAS. The high school will test MCAS. Um, and they've made some slight modifications in the long comp for um, the earlier grades in the MCAS test. The MCAS that we um, are quite familiar with will include more embedded PARC-like questions because the Department of Ed has clearly um, indicated to everyone that the final, they're calling it the next generation of assessments, they're calling it MCAS 2.0, um, it will be in the development stages and will look more PARC-like. And that's something we knew that was, you know, that was foreshadowed last year. We haven't written the test yet for this year. No, they're actually going out for bid. And the there will be. That, like the March test? Yes, they have. Okay. So the, the original plan was even for those districts that were um, going to adopt MCAS again this year, mm -hmm. the test would look more park like. Okay. Um, and so but they just decided that. I don't think no, they're just right in un test. Unfortunately, for a lot of our schools um, and a lot of districts, <clears throat> right now we would be planning the schedule. So even though they've released a tentative schedule, um, that just was uh, that just came out December seventh in a revised format, and the districts need to wait until the decisions are made. Um, one of our concerns when they first came out with a December eighteenth vote is a uh, date is that while it's not mandated per se this time that the school committees take a vote, it is highly recommended that we encourage our school committees to vote, uh, PAC or MCAS. And um, you know, a lot of districts, our school, the school committees aren't in session or really haven't had any dialogue around this issue at all. We've sort of had this ongoing conversation about what our state assessment would look like and, and certainly leading up to this vote, we've had many conversations. Um, and so the state, is allowing uh, districts who just simply don't does not the, the the districts do not have time to to um, adequately review the impact of the vote to file for a waiver to extend that. But our schools are you know they're ready. They they want to get these schedules out to parents. Parents want to know what the testing um, window is. Uh, it falls right in the middle of you know springtime, and you know people like to make plans. Attendance at these uh, sessions is is critical. They are making some significant changes, however, um, it is very likely that a school district can fall in um, from level two, from level one to level two because two students in any particular subgroup may not test that day. And so they're increasing the attendance rate factor and um, they're um, lowering the subgroup numbers. So they're making some changes regardless of what the test format's going to look like in the actual accountability. So. Um, we're hopeful that um, next week, Wednesday, at the combined meeting, uh, when all three committees are seated, uh, we will take a, a vote um, okay. on one or the other. And there is a, just so you know, there is a position paper that will be come out in the packets, very similar to the one that was that I crafted two years ago, and also a lot of information about what the testing cycle will look like. Um, it is conceivable that in one, um, one parent, depending on if the district chooses to continue with PARC, and they have no choice, but if an MCAS district chooses to go in the direction of PARC this year, that, that parent will receive three different accountability reports and you know, various other types of um, information that is somewhat inconsistent.
depending on where their kid, their students fall in the in the uh, grade three to twelve continuum. Exciting times. <laughs> All right, uh, brings us to the fiscal sixteen budget. Yes, the FY16 budget is in your packet. There are no significant variances, and we would need a vote to, aud to uh, approve until audited. Okay. Do you want to make a motion? I'll make a motion. A motion to improve the South Grove Public School District financial report of November 30th to audited. Second. Second, Kathleen. Any discussion? Is it the report that needs to be approved or the budget? The budget report. The expenditure report. The budget. The expenditure report. report. That yeah. yeah, that's that. I read it right off of here. Mm -hmm. Budget. Any discussion? All in favor? Unanimous. Fiscal 17 preliminary budget discussion. <clears throat> we, uh, first, I'd like to applaud. Um, our school administration. They um, have provided us with wonderful information after fully assessing their, their needs and um, some wants in this year's budget. And uh, Cheryl has been doing her usual um, magic, magic <laughs> masterful crunching of numbers. And um, very shortly we will be inviting um, the budget subcommittee to reconvene so that we can really look at the numbers. But uh, as we look at those numbers that we've been able to put together so far and do um, some analysis, uh, the drivers this year, the impacts on, um, or the factors impacting the FY17 budget really are about the contractual raises where um, the negotiated raises were entering the third and I guess the final frontier or the final year of our contract and soon into next year we'll be beginning that process again. And so um, the contractual increases um, are about 2%, or not, not about, but the COLA increase is 2%. So that's something that is in, impacting the budget process, as it would always do. Um, we also um, are very cognizant and very mindful of um, our commitment to provide reliable and um, current innovative technology and software to our, in our schools. And I think a perfect example of that was this evening. Last year, we made a commitment to um, continue to monitor what um, the technology landscape was in our schools and to spend um, some dollars in professional development. And I think, as you <coughs> pointed out, Mary Beth, you can, you can see the, product, the, um, the yield uh, and the investment that we had in our teachers, um, in part because of uh, what all of the information Kathleen shared with us this evening. So um, this year, we, we are using our um, technology uh, analysis that we put together last year, which really does provide a snapshot of where we are in each of our schools in terms of reliable devices and 21st century classrooms, um, and the, the readiness around um, teachers being prepared to use the technology that we have in our schools. And so um, as we continue our conversations, we'll actually be able to clearly see the number of reliable devices, the, the ratio of, to device to student, and, and that's what we've been using as we talk about our needs around technology. Um, again, professional development, but also you know, the, the tools that we're going to put in the hands of our teachers. So that's been very helpful and um, has really provided a, a solid foundation for the discussions that we've had. Uh, certainly, we want to make sure that we're providing an equity, um, an equity of access to this, this um, these tools in all of our schools, and that's allowed us to do that in a very um, clear, data-driven manner. Uh, we're, we're going to be happy to share that out as well. Um, I think that you know, uh, um, Rhoda alluded to two areas of um, need uh, in terms of staffing, and, and one would be our continued growth in our ELL population. If you looked at the um, the chart that uh, Rhoda had pre prepared for us about, you know, where the students enter and when they exit and the number of hours required versus the number of students, you know, we're in excess of 250 hours of just focused instruction that is a minimum uh, amount of time uh, for these 94 students. And so we'll be looking at, you know, what our English language learner instructor needs are and then also um, the behavioral supports at the preschool 
K and one level um, as part of the budget process. So I think that we will be well prepared to um, have our preliminary budget ready uh, to share in January. second week of January or something right and you know, they're just kind of in the same right. position we are they're just, just collecting starting. figures okay. from all department heads and so forth so you know, we're basically in the same place more mm -hmm. or less and they uh, so much that where the town thinks their revenue is going to be just right. they can drive where they mm -hmm. but that, that'll come that'll come right I just didn't know if you were hearing anything <coughs> we haven't got that number yet right what you need to our feeling <laughs> I, mean, I think the, the good news is we're, you know the, co the collaboration continues and yeah, I no, think you know there's all indications that that's going how we proceed mm -hmm. into this year's uh, budget process um, we do know that uh, the financial advisory will be assigning a liaison to the schools mm -hmm. so um, that information will, will be coming forward mm -hmm. as that, that, that has I'm not sure if we had a specific liaison assigned last year. Yeah, but you did before last year. Well, mm. that, that goes back. That's why we have some time. Yeah. I thought that four years. Just yeah. having a specific one or two kind of disappeared for a while, but maybe I'm just not kind of aware. I'm looking forward to the opportunity. I think that you know, it, mm -hmm. the more, the sooner we yeah. can address yeah, any concerns and good. respond to some questions. I think that'll be um, a positive result when we present before the um, entire financial advisory. So I think it'll be a positive step. Mm -hmm. More conversations. Um, I do want to um, reflect on a presentation that we had in September, and seek some direction from the committee in terms of um, how we would like to um, <coughs> pursue the conversation around kindergarten uh, I know that this has been a topic last year um, it, it was presented in the midst of the budget process and um, again we started this year with um, some interest uh, around the um, current kin kindergarten model and um, the half versus free day, uh, full day um, kindergarten. And we did have a presentation in, in September. So um, we have an opportunity to do some budget modeling. Um, Cheryl and I have chatted a little bit about what that might look like um, beyond the five year progression that we talked about earlier. And so if there's a will from the committee for us to pursue that, um, then with the preliminary budget we could potentially present a couple models that um, would be uh, available for discussion yeah I think we should right? yeah I think that's the best approach I mean we discussed that in our last subcommittee meeting and mm -hmm. I think that, that would definitely make sense okay and I think you know part of that we've talked about is where would we possibly get some more state funding mm -hmm. if we do that? I think knowing knowing if that's possible and what that offset might be. Okay. Not that it's going to totally offset it, but that's a piece of it. And unfortunately, it's really going, as I said last time, I'm like, mm -hmm. you know, nobody is going to disagree that it's not a great idea, but it comes down to money. And, you know, and it's not just the school budget, it's the town's budget in mm -hmm. general. And is that where, you know, we're we're asking for sustained three hundred and something three hundred thousand dollars right. increase to our budget. So yeah. it's, it's you know that's a great program. There's lots of other great programs. So it's really right. it, that's what it's going to come down to. Obviously. Well, yeah. So mm -hmm. that's what the scenarios would show. Right? If we do this, mm -hmm. right. are we do we have to cut something else to do it? Right. 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 And so, I, and that's where then we take that to the bigger town committees. We do know, um, Cheryl and I worked at um, opposite ends and, and met in the middle, actually, um, 
she reached out to her contact at the Department of Ed, uh, Melissa King, and I um, asked Dave Tobin, Mr. Chapter 70, who used to also be uh, someone who uh, worked at ACIBED and was very familiar to our district, who unfortunately is retiring uh, his position as uh, Chapter 70 guru at the state level. Just um, in time to change the formula. Just in time to change the formula. <laughs> But hopefully he'll be around to consult with us on many, many issues and was very quick to respond, both um, he and, and uh, Melissa King. And we asked them to analyze, basically, our situation for us um, in terms of where we are with Chapter 70, um, the number of students that would migrate from um, the half count to the full count, and what that would look like in terms of Chapter 78. So Cheryl, I'm going to recount and you or you can start and I can chime in whichever you prefer because we ended up in the same place and that basically is if in if our enrollments had been on um, on an upward trajectory rather than over time declining the overall incremental increase would have been that 371,000 number that we talked about. However, the multiplier for that um, increment, as we know, Chapter 70 has varying percentages of uh, funding depending on the student population, would, would have been about 17.5%, which meant that um, if we had not been on, a, um, on the trajectory that we are in terms of enrollment, of enrollments, it would be about a 17 and a half percent times 371 or around seventy thousand dollars sixty five thousand dollars but another variable has been introduced into this chapter 70 um, formula and that is Southboro like many towns have has been held harmless and that held harmless um, we use that a lot now we use it for accountability <laughs> levels in MCAS and park conversations but in this instance, what it means is that even though our population was declining, the town, the state held us harmless and continued to fund us our Chapter 70 funding at the levels we were at prior to any decline. And so basically what that does at the dollar levels or percentage levels? At the Chapter 70 foundation budget level. So what that means is any yield that we would have realized is basically um, negated by the fact that we've been held harmless um, for this amount of time. So I, I asked, well, what about? What about you know, some neighboring districts that have really moved forward with this initiative? And um, Mr. Tobin was able to identify, and Melissa as well, the factors that allow them to see an increase and the factors that are not present in the same scenario for us to realize any significant gains. For example, there are a couple neighboring districts whose population has definitely um, moved forward. And because that population increase was realized at all grade levels, the increment of assigned to chapter funding, 70 funding varied. And so not just because of the half day students uh, migrating to full day was there an increase realized, but rather that increase, increase was realized because it also happened at the same time that the overall population was increasing, and that population was K-12. So that's how they were able to access some additional Chapter 70 funding. So that really changes our conversation and the scenarios that we build to um, share with the committee next, next month. Um, with respect to the grants, it is as uncertain as the five or so letters, four letters that we sent to our um, representatives last year. Um, there's no indication that the grants will increase. There's no indication that the grants will remain even funded as we move into this year. And as we know last year, it really was a moving target right up until you know, the end of the school year. It was on, it was off, it was in, it was out. And so um, that seems to be pretty much the same this year. The only um, 
potential funding possibility and to what extent it actually benefit it might benefit us um, in our district is um, there is a strong feeling that some funding will become available through grant opportunities for preschool to meet the high the high needs population entering the schools at the preschool level and to some extent that may positively impact us in the overall budget but uh, for the most part our preschools are tuition a typical children at tuition so that remains to be seen um, not necessarily what we want to share Run but certainly out. important Run Run yeah <laughs> that's what you're saying right. well, no, no, no. Okay. Got a but I think it's important to share no, that you know because a lot of uh, the the assumption around the kindergarten um, we'll conversations on, is that this chapter 70 and so it's nice to really get um, two exact um, analyses for us to, to, to share. <coughs> so. Okay. Okay. Anything else on the budget? All right. Fiscal 17 budget priorities or in the packet. Haven't yeah. changed. Mm -hmm. Budget calendar. Budget calendar reflects the meetings that we've actually had. We've had a couple in December, and um, a dual poll is coming out soon to schedule our next meeting uh, so that we can review the uh, preliminary budget before <coughs> school committee. Okay. <coughs> Enrollments. We have NESDEC numbers. We have NESDEC numbers. So I, I read through and highlighted, for some reason they decided to redline this year. And to, from, from my uh, viewpoint, the birth rate is um, declining, but the migration into this community is slightly on the uptick. And that's why we're you know, realizing the increased enrollments wherever we might. Kathleen um, certainly had a few kids, a students enroll in fifth grade this year, I think, right? And then our kindergarten numbers. Yeah. So that's, you know, it's people moving into the community, but the birth rate is declining. But it was kind of interesting reading through it because yeah. th that was one of the things that they noted. But I sensed there was a little bit of copying and pasting in there from prior year reports. But <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but but it, it was interesting. I think one thing that they know though is that they it's hard for them to to explain because no one really knows why the kindergarten numbers are going up when they're looking at birth rates that are that are going down. Mm -hmm. and, and what they say obviously is the only thing could be is people moving into town and with with young we're not with, with young children and. And then they go to explain that, that real estate, you know, sales are picking up in real estate. And they said, as a matter of fact, they'd even be more than they are today, except, except that some of the empty nests aren't selling because <coughs> prices are going up so fast mm -hmm. that they want to stay in their homes until they feel it levels out ah. again. You know? And, and these, could all, these could all be true things, yeah. but, but one thing you know after you work with the numbers for a while is it's really hard to determine exactly what these populations are going to be. And the best thing to do is to be safe and conservative with the numbers. And mm -hmm. I think that we have been. Um, Uh, it's been, I think, three years since we did that housing study. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I wonder if it's time to plug some new numbers in there. I think it is. It is. Right. That, was, right. that was one we did somewhere. They thought we'd have 89 kids in kindergarten. Exactly. It's so far off. And, and even it's in the projections the, they're doing now, they, they have the, the numbers of, right. I think, of 110. And we're 130. Right. You know, so exactly. you know, there's, it, there's just a, these numbers need to be looked at and kind of worked <coughs> over again. Yeah, no, I think that's a good idea. I think we should. Do you know when we, 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 do we want to do it this year? Or? Sort of <coughs> well, the last one came out February of 2013. So mm -hmm. if we can get it done in the next couple of months, then that'll be three years. I was saying from the central office point of view, maybe. We're going to say March, April, oh, sort of, oh, you right. know, yeah. not the next couple, the next couple of months is not when that's, they really need to be doing that's this. That's next one. So. <laughs> oh. I was thinking of actually breaking so up the old you, spreadsheets. Right? You're welcome. You know, and, I, and, and taking a look at it myself and going back to some of the old documents that we have. Um, we have all the thumb drives yeah. with all the right. original um, documents, so right. updating those would probably be a lot simpler than be, than creating new ones. But yeah. I just, oh, have, I just, I just yeah. have to go yeah. back into them and try to remember what I did. That's it. <laughs> Anytime you want that thumb drive, I think I, I, I have, have, I have them all. I think, I think I put them up in, a, in the cloud somewhere, but a safe cloud. A safe cloud. 
But I think that would is, be great for the financial conversation too. I'm sure we'll have some questions about enrollments when we go before advisory. Right. So yeah. to have that prepared. But I mean, it is as simple as that, right? Just plugging in the new numbers to the. It's it's it will be very simple. Okay. It, it, mm -hmm. I, right. I'll try that one. Yeah. Well, well, the last time we did it, we had meetings. We had a lot of people right, involved. Right, right. This will simply be an update by looking at the spreadsheets, using a little bit of common sense. We understand how these forecasts are built now, okay? Right. And just looking at them and coming up with some new numbers. Right. And I think there you were. volunteering to do that? Oh, well, of course, I'll help. I just have to, I have to just go back and look at those spreadsheets again and remember, remember what I do. <laughs> But yeah, yeah, I think I think we can plan it, and I'll, and I'll be glad to you sure. know do as much work on them as I can. I think I'll be able to get it done. I have an entire file drawer with all of the findings and the assumptions well, from the last study. Yeah. Well, well, the main thing is that we can't. One thing we wouldn't do is we'd look at the projected headcount forecast. Mm -hmm. But one thing that I can't do is I can't look at space utilization in the right. schools because I just don't know right. that. But I certainly can look at it at a macro level what I think the forecast would be. Yeah. And right. and the utilization has actually changed. Right. I think in all of our schools since then. So that would be an important conversation to add to yep. the numbers, the new numbers it as like well. There was only one grade that was... Uh, that one little grade. Yeah. Well, well, well one, one grade where the projection was, was actually less. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the other grade, well, in fact, actually was more. But you know, one thing we know though is the last time that we did this, when we did it three years ago, we looked at kindergarten numbers in the in the projections, which I don't have with me or in my head right now. That was that was significantly less than well, what we're seeing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so we know that that that, that the, the the increase in kindergarten headcount ripples through the whole system. If, right. if it's two classes in kindergarten, it's two classes in first grade, all the way through. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So, um, yeah, I know. You know but, 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 it ripples through, but isn't but but, yep. but, but doesn't but, but isn't it? it uh, Kind of revised. Well, when you see the well, for when example, when you see, see the, 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 the one well variance, doesn't that get carried through the projections? That right. can change every year, right. but wouldn't it carry well, through if you the have rest you, of the grades at that time? Well, if you really have, let, let's say, like 130 students in kindergarten, like right. we have today, you could expect a certain ratio, okay, a multiple of that, okay, to be a first grade, grade class. Right. So your first grade class might be 145. Okay, Understood. and the thing is that's different than a first a kindergarten class of 130 and a first grade class of 145. When you compare it to a prior forecast or forecast that somebody else had done that said kindergarten would be 85 and first grade would be 90. Because mm -hmm. sure. what happens is as it, as, you, as it moves up through the system, as long as it keeps getting backfilled with large kindergarten classes. Um, yep, okay. Okay, that, that's kind of the way we're working it. One thing that I did notice here is that we're looking at some of the largest kindergarten classes that we've had in 10 years. Mm -hmm right now too and that's just something else for to, to keep in mind is just little thoughts as we go through and we look at the projections again good work to follow <laughs> there's nothing else on that we can move on to educational policy update on the fall 2015 stone and Washington DC trips Mr. Lavoy is back Yes. And I know he was tweeting as well. I was tweeting. Sent some wonderful pictures wow. out on the from the uh, trip. Yes, uh, of the different Arlington spots we go in, and the, and the parents I think appreciated overall the added level of communication. But um, we had a, a great round of trips this fall. Both the Stone trip and uh, Washington D.C. trip were uh, uh, participation rates were up uh, in both for both trips for the last years, comparative to the um, previous years. Um, strong outreach by our Assistant Principal Gary Hershek and our team leader Sandy Scordato to join the uh, NERI crew for a Monday morning meeting mm -hmm. to help launch the trip in the spring of last year. That re really helped get the thinking along the lines of what the trip would entail. It, I think it really helped to reduce overall anxiety that kids and families were having about an overnight trip up in the woods of New Hampshire. Um, and ultimately it did pay a dividend because then during the orientation process and everything else you could see that things were a lot more under control and I think it led to a, a much more valuable experience. Um, the other wor noteworthy things about the Stone Trip this year is there have been curriculum shifts with the next generation science standards that are pending but coming. Um, a lot of uh, different um, units of study have moved into the sixth grade and the Stone staff worked with us to adjust the different uh, um, activities that the kids went through including the addition of uh, astronomy and the mother mm -hmm. different uh, 
revisions as long as like the wetlands biomes and things of that nature. So the standards were directly connected to what the activities were happening. And overall, <coughs> the, uh, the report was an, an excellent experience. The kids really enjoyed uh, being out there, really connecting with the, the environment and, and making some um, uh, good memories. Uh, that, uh, that are lasting. So uh, that was a very, very positive experience, and we hope to do it again in October of 2016 as, as usual. Um, as far as the DC trip, we had 140 students and 15 chaperones go down to DC over the Veterans Day weekend, um, or midweek to weekend. And it was another good trip, you know. The weather cooperated, uh, which is always good in November. You never know what you're going to get, but it stayed in the high 50s, low 60s, very comfortable, minimal precipitation. We could stay outside and do our, our itinerary was not interrupted. So because we are on coaches the entire time, we can get to many places in the course of the day. Um, and the last year was the first time we added the night. I don't know if you recall that or not, mm -hmm. we made it instead of a two-night trip, a three-night trip. The, the dividend of that has just been huge. So we've done it now for two years in a row, and the experience has been outstanding. So that last day, we used to lose not only momentum with uh, chaperones and students, but you know things we weren't able to get as much accomplished as we were in the past. But these past two trips, we have been able to keep them chock full from beginning to end. And I really attest that to that night and not the middle of the morning leaving. Uh, so that has been a huge improvement um, for the overall experience. So we, we hope to do it again in 2016 uh, over the Veterans Day uh, holiday. Um, it will go from a Wednesday night into a Saturday night with Sunday to recover. And we're back to school on Monday the following week. So that's what we hope to do for 2016. And I tweeted. Yes, I did tweet. Yes, did. Excellent, yeah. excellent tweet. Yes, yes, yes. yes. I did see some Facebook stuff and people they did, yeah. That. Yeah. And that's been such a good addition. I know we, for many years, worried about cell phones on the trip and what that would create. It's honestly created nothing but positive things. Um, communication with families, the ability to um, just connect with each other, whether it be in the case of an emergency, the peace of mind. It, it's just added to the trip where we really haggled over it. I think for months we debated, all uh, the chaperones debated about how we would regulate and control and this and that. And it's really worked its way into being an integral part of the communication structure and um, making it successful for a lot more kids. And that's been, that's been something that's carried over, whether kids have anxiety about being away from home or knowing that they are you know, um, with their classmates, just having that peace of mind is uh, something that has actually played out pretty positively, I'd say. Don't lose them at the mall. Don't lose them at the mall. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So with that in mind, and uh, after sharing such good news and appreciating how much uh, the communication needs to happen to make for a successful yeah. trip and yeah. all the details that need to be planned for and uh, scheduled and arranged. That's right. um, I would like to recommend that we vote this evening mm -hmm. to approve the um, Stone environmental trip once again for our sixth graders and the Washington DC trip for our eighth graders. Correct. Okay. <coughs> there you go. I'll make a motion. i make a motion we accept the Stone environmental sixth grade field trip and the Washington, D.C. 8th grade field trip for the school year 2016-2017. Second. All right. Any discussion? I have just a couple questions. Um, <clears throat> when did we ever provide scholarships for the D.C. trip? We did. We did. Um, the current situation is that the company uh, that we go through does offer scholarships on a needs basis, and that's done directly with the company that we, we work with. Um, the application process is followed, um, and, and that has benefited uh, a number of families. Um, this past year, actually, we got an, an anonymous donation uh, from a family uh, wanting to be able to send a, a student on the trip, and they, they directed that money at that student. So it was actually between the families that it occurred, and we didn't touch a dime. So you know, those that type of thing has has been has been occurring, um, but no, we are not providing any direct scholarships um, from the school. Do we know what the cost is going to be? Uh, roughly uh, eleven hundred, which is the same as last year, not an increase, same as last year. That's what we're okay. predicting. 
Is there any kind of fundraising that we do around that? We've, in, we've uh, looked at different types of fundraising options. Um, and the one thing that we've always uh, related it to is by the time families and kids get to middle school, fundraising can kind of peter out a little bit. Um, and we compare it to our volleyball marathon, which is our biggest fundraiser of the year, which many of you have participated at one way or another. And that event, in its all of its work and effort, raises about $15,000 which is outstanding, that would only be $100 per student. Right. It really wouldn't make a huge dent in what mm -hmm. needs to happen for the family. So that's why we do like to get approval in December, and I will start the um, solicitation of the trip uh, right after the uh, Christmas holiday. And I really talk to the students about participating in the payment of their own trip, whether they're mowing lawns, babysitting, raking leaves, doing things of that nature to help offset the cost has actually been a pretty good instrument uh, for kids being able to have a, a, an investment in their own trip. And some students have reported that they've actually paid for their own trip by way of um, working in, in the community in different ways, babysitting, umpiring. Um, raking leaves, the list goes on. So that's actually been a more effective way of pushing it than doing a bake sale uh, that we found. Yeah, I, th I know, I, I always thought with my own kids, we sort of had an agreement on what was their responsibility, what was mm -hmm. my responsibility, sort of, and it, it worked well. I thought it was a good family tool of, you know, you, you're responsible for your, I don't know what it was, they had to bring their own spending money and pay a certain amount. And, right. And, it was really just for responsibility and to have them buy into and it. Ownership. But that was a family decision and whatever, but I, I know a lot of people did. And I'll, so I'm asked that, uh, Paul, I'm asked that question about every year, and that's the answer I give, and I give similar situations to what Mary Beth described as being a pretty good formula. Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't necessarily write the check, uh, right. but it gets, it can, it can take the, uh, the bite out of yep. the, of the, of the pay, so. And the, the companies are very flexible with payment plans. That's the other thing that the, they have recently started to offer. It's not just a deadline. You have to have a nickel in. If they, uh, they engage with a company on a payment structure that can take it from you know, January right up until the day we leave. And if hardship mm -hmm. does arise, they extend it beyond the trip. They don't want to take the experience away from the kids. So that is something that's done by, with the flexibility of the company. That's good. Yeah, it's pretty good. I haven't heard many families taking advantage of that, though. So um, I think people are finding finding a way and mm -hmm. making it happen. And I really respect that because it is a lot of money. Any further discussion? All in favor? It's unanimous. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, policy development distribution. None at this None time. At this time. Personnel items, do we have any personnel reports? Any personnel, just um, noteworthy, we have two long-standing members of our South Borough community who will be retiring. James Robbins, a custodian at Woodward School, and Evelyn Maynard, technology teacher at Trottier. So Congratulations. We wish them all good luck. Thank you for And communications? And then at this time. Action on minutes from November 10th. The minutes are in your packet for review and vote to accept. Very best. Make a motion to accept the minutes for the open meeting of November 10th, 2015. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Opposed? Staying? I guess it's still unanimous. Mm-hmm. Bills and payrolls. I'm sure Cheryl has Cheryl has a pile on there. Yellow pile. <coughs> and Jenna items for next month. We have the fiscal 17 preliminary budget. Anything else? I'm sure there'll be many more items be to add between now and January, but I think that will be the key focus of our conversation. Mm -hmm. Preliminary budget. Okay. In that case, audience sharing. Audience seems to have left. You have lost the audience. <laughs> Sam's still there. <laughs> He's still there. We'll just say hi. Hi, Sam. <laughs> uh, I guess we could have a motion to adjourn. I move we adjourn. Second. All in favor?
favor. We are adjourned. Yeah.